Good morning, good morning. Thank you everyone for joining us. We're a little bit late this morning, um, but we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'm Marsha Burden. I am um, an associate professor at Southern University Law Center in the clinical education department. And I manage the divorce and domestic violence law clinic. I am also um, a, a professor who teaches um, family law. So this morning, I just want to share with you some of the recent developments in the legislation um, for the 2021 regular session. So if you will um, bear with me, we will begin. Okay. So um, the first thing I want to talk about, I'm going to just start with um, the children's code. And with the Children's Code, we have a few new provisions. Act number six provides for uniform post-placement functions associated with the agency adoptions and private adoptions prior to finalization. So there are some requirements that must be met after a child is placed um, with the agency or private adoption. Okay. Um, Um, it requires multiple visits by a social worker, um, counselor, psychologist. I'm not sure if this is doing it right. A psychiatrist or um, a second. or a therapist. prior to the final agency of private adopt, uh, adoption decree. So there has to be multiple visits before there's a final uh, decree and the observations that are made during the uh, visit shall be used in making recommendations for the finalizations for adoptions. And it also requires that families and children be provided assistance, consultation and 24 hour crisis intervention throughout the finalization process. It requires courts to report adoptions and statistical uh, non-identifying information to the Department of Children and Family Services and requires the department to release a yearly report of adoption statistics within the state and adoptions that place the child out of state. It also provides that courts may render a final decree at the first hearing in a private adoption if the child has lived in the petitioner's home for at least six months. So this is pretty much done with, away with the interlocutory decree. If you've done adoptions, um, normally at the, after six months of the child being placed in the home, there's an interlocutory decree and then six months later, a final um, decree of adoption. However, this is saying if the child has already lived in the home, for six months, then you can get that final decree at the first hearing, which would normally be the interlocutory decree. Okay, and then this new law um, under Act Number 378 establishes an income tax deduction for a taxpayer who adopts a child who is in foster care, as defined in the existing law, the Children's Code, Article 603 or a youth receiving extended foster care services pursuant to existing law, revised statute 46288. And um, that comes under the extended foster care program act. So there can be an income tax deduction in those instances. Under act 378, the new law also establishes an income tax deduction for a taxpayer who adopts an infant who is unrelated to the taxpayer and who is less than one year of age through a private agency or through an attorney. For purposes of the new law, the age of the infant is determined at the time of the adoption placement. 
So this gives tax deductions in both of these instances under Act 378. Under Act 158, it makes technical changes to the children's code. Um, they remove du duplicated language. Um, it provides for due process rights of the parties in the child in need of care case at the time of the disposition hearing. So when there's to be a determination as to what is going to happen with that child, it provides certain due process rights for all of the parties. It also incorporates into the definition of abuse, the female genital mutilation of a sister of the child. And I'll talk about that again in a second. And under Act 158, it also authorizes service on non-resident parents to be made by either registered or certified male. Under Act Number 158, when they uh, indicate that it places female genital mutilation in the abuse article instead of as a, a ground for a child in need of care. And so now it's considered as abuse. And it clearly provides for the rights of parties at disposition to testify, confront witnesses, present evidence, and retain counsel. Under House Bill number, I mean, under Act number 367, it expands the definition of a caretaker. That definition now includes operators of early learning centers, operators and employees of restrictive care facilities, and adults who reside with and care for a child. And under Act number 126, it now requires that state and local law enforcement officers who arrest a person to inquire whether the person is a parent or guardian of a minor or a dependent child who may be at risk as a result of the arrest and to make reasonable efforts to ensure the safety of such minor or dependent child. It also provides exceptions it's when the arrested caregiver presents a threat of serious bodily injury or death or is in the act of committing a crime of violence. And that's when an exception would come in for the law enforcement officer um, to not be able to assess the risk at that time because of the nature of the, um, the serious um, bodily injury or death threats that may be um, presented by the person being arrested. Okay, and under Act number 123, um, it eliminates certain fees, costs, and taxes in juvenile delinquency cases. So when we have juvenile delinquency cases, nobody budgets to have to pay for court costs, taxes, um, any fees that's associated with that. And of course, the public defender's office can't afford to pay those things. So um, this act uh, elimis eliminates um, certain fees, costs, and taxes in relation to juvenile delinquency cases, including calls for juvenile detention centers, fees imposed for transcript requests, fees imposed for an order for a physical or mental examination and any other fees associated with representing a child in a juvenile delinquency case. Okay, and under act number 421, um, this is dealing with children and newborns. Um, this act authorizes the installation and use of a newborn safety device at certain infant relinquishment sites, and that's designated under the safe haven law. The safe haven law provides that in addition to leaving an infant in the care of an employee of a designated emergency care facility, a parent may relinquish their infant by using a newborn safety device that is physically located inside a hospital that has an emergency department that is staffed 24 hours per day. And I've actually seen this demonstrated on the news. So I know we have that here in East Baton Rouge Parish. It states that each newborn safety device is required to be in a location that ensures the anonymity of the relinquishing parent and has a climate controlled environment. The access door 
to the device has to lock automatically upon closure when a newborn is in the device. The device features a safe sleep environment, which includes a firm flat bassinet mattress and a sheet that fits snugly on and overlaps the mattress and is free of pillows, bumpers, blankets, and other bedding. So a, a parent who is relinquishing their child may simply go into this climate controlled environment and place the child in a bassinet type um, um, bed and uh, the bed is safe. And then once they leave, um, the, the parent has to sign. Um, there, it requires a signage. I'm sorry, the parent does not have to sign, it's anonymous. It requires a signage to clearly identify the device and provide both written and pictorial instruction to the relinquishing parents to open the access door. So when um, the parent enters this room, there is um, instructions available. There are instructions available on how to place the infant inside the device and how to close the access door to engage the lock. And then the maximum age of an infant who may be relinquished in accordance with existing law is 60 days of age. So up to two months, they can relinquish a child in this manner. And that by placing an infant in a newborn safety device, a parent is foregoing all parental responsibilities with respect to the infant and is giving consent for the state to take custody of the infant. It requires a dual alarm system that generates an audible alarm at a central location within the facility 60 seconds after the opening of the, the access door to the device. It generates an automatic call to 911 if the alarm is activated and not turned off from within the facility less than 60 seconds after the commencement of the initial alarm. And is visually checked at least two times per day to ensure that it is working, it is in working order. So as, as this parent relinquishes the child and the alarm goes off to notify the staff that there's an infant in the, um, in the facility to which they need to give immediate attention to. Okay, and we're almost through with the children's code, but under act number 482, it requires that the annual statistical reports on abortions published by the Louisiana Department of Health include a special section addressing abortions performed on minors. So they have to give statistics on how many abortions are actually uh, performed on minors. Under article, uh, I mean, act number 350, this is in, in compliance with article 672.3 in um, child custody cases. And it indicates that there has to be a diligent search for relatives, notice, and then they inform them of uh, what happens if they fail to respond. When a child is placed into the custody of the Department of Children and Family Services, DCFS, it specifies that a diligent search for relatives shall include at a minimum, interviews with the parent, child, identified relatives, and any other person who is likely to have information about the identity or location of an adult relative or persons who have a significant relationship with the child. So normally when the child comes into care and they're in state's custody, before um, the state places them with the stranger, they have to do a diligent search for any relatives or anybody who may be able to care for their child, or anyone who has a significant relationship with the child and comprehensive searches of databases and other resources that are available to DCFS, which may include the school, employment, residence, utilities, vehicle registration, child support enforcement, law enforcement, corrections, records, and any other records likely to result in identifying and locating the person being sought. All relatives identified in the diligence search uh, subject to ex exceptions due to family or domestic violence or other safety concerns 
shall be provided with a notice explaining the options a relative has to participate in the care and placement of the alleged dependent child and any options that may be lost by failing to respond to the notice. Okay, so normally they would notify a, a relative that this child is in state's custody, explain to them their options. You can um, have the child physically placed with you until we you know, locate the parent and go through the court process as one option. Um, and just let them know that if a child remains in the system, they may um, go through the process of court and which can eventually lead to termination of parental rights, which may lead to adoption. Um, this act also provides in the case of a child under the age of six, the court may find that continuation of the child's placement with the current caregiver is in the child's best interest. If the child is in a stable home environment where the child's physical and emotional needs are met by a person who has a significant relationship with the child and that no relative or other suitable caregiver has been identified as a concurrent plan caregiver as part of the child's case plan or report submitted to the court. And it further states that it provides that upon a finding by the court, the department shall not make any change in placement absent prior written notice to the court. Okay, so now that concludes everything that's new um, that I wanted to present to you from the Children's Code. So now we're gonna move on to civil procedure and family law, especially where we're looking at the changes um, in relation to preliminary defaults, okay? Um, so under Act number 174, it removes preliminary defaults. It requires the plaintiff to send notice of intent to obtain a default judgment by certified mail at least seven days prior to the rendition of the default judgment, unless that notice is waived. And I'll look at that in a little bit more detail in a second. In delictual actions, the plaintiff may send notice of intent to obtain default judgment by regular mail at the address where service was obtained. And if the defendant is not represented by an attorney or a counsel of record. In cases involving um, Civil Code Article 103, one divorce, and we all know that that's when the parties have lived separate and apart continuously prior to filing that petition of divorce, it states that when the defendant files an affidavit waiving citation, service, all delays and notice, it, uh, the new law required, uh, allows a default judgment of divorce against the defendant after two days. So we're gonna look at the distinction um, in a second, but this is gonna take effect on January 1st of 2022. The changes in the present law requirement to file an answer is changed from 15 days to 21 days after service of citation or from 10 days to 15 days after an exception is overruled or referred to the merits or the amended petition is served. And so under Act 174, it eliminates the requirement of obtaining a preliminary default confirmation before obtaining a final default judgment. So normally the process is you um, file your petition after the parties have lived separate and apart, either 180 days when there are no minor children or 365 days when there are minor children. And the party, the defendant is served with the copy of the petition or the defendant can execute um, a waiver of service. So in this instance, if the defendant has been served with, um, with the petition and he does not file an answer or she does not file an answer within 15 days, the normal process would be to obtain the preliminary default by filing the motion asking for a preliminary default to be entered because there has been no answer or opposition to the divorce um, after the person has been served. So this law eliminates 
this new, uh, this act indicates that they're eliminating the preliminary default and the confirmation thereof. It provides for the rendition of a default judgment in favor of a plaintiff who establishes a prima facie case that the, when the defendant fails to answer or file other pleadings within the prescribed time, and only if the plaintiff provided the required notice of the intent to obtain a default judgment or if the defendant waives such notice. So you can get a default judgment. Um, they've taken out the final default judgment, um, says a default judgment, but you have to show that you provide notice to the defendant of the intent to obtain a default judgment or if the defendant waives such notice. It says in um, Civil Code Article 103.1, divorce, if the defendant acknowledges receipt of the petition and files an affidavit waiving citation, serves all delays, notice, and appearance, a default judgment of divorce may be rendered two days, exclusive of legal holidays, after the affidavit is filed. So once they file that waiver, a written waiver, then you can get a default judgment two days after that affidavit is filed. And the affidavit of the defendant may be prepared or notarized by any notary puppet. Okay. And Act number 174 further states that notwithstanding any other provision of the law, to the contrary, when the demand is for divorce under Civil Code Articles 103.1 or 103.5, which is your um, domestic violence article 103.5. Uh, it states whether or not the demand contains a claim for relief incidental or ancillary thereto, a hearing in open court shall not be required unless the judge in his discretion directs that a hearing be held. So with the 103.1 and 103.5, you don't have to have a hearing to finalize your divorce. And I'll just go into 103.5 in a second. Um, there is a new requirement under Act Number 68. It requires every pleading to contain the email address of the party. If he has an email address or the email address of the party's attorney for service or process. So that means you can be served through email. It allows for service of a pleading or order setting a court date to be made by emailing the document to the designated email address. And of course you have to have a computer or some um, source to prove that you did send that document through email. You have to have your receipts. So it also allows certain orders and judgments to be signed in any place where the district judge is physically located. So it doesn't just have to be in chambers, okay? It allows the district court and courts of limited jurisdiction to sign orders and judgments while outside of the jurisdiction under all circumstances. So they can sign it when they're in Destin. It also allows judicial proceedings that may be conducted in chambers to also be conducted by audiovisual means. So now we have uh, Zoom meetings um, and it repeals the exclusion of adoption, um, divorce, or other matters of family law from the scope of the Louisiana Uniform Electronic Transactions Act. And it repeals provisions regarding matters conducted by the district court during vacation. Okay, so that's under Act number 68. Um, going back to Act number 174, um, this is again dealing with default judgments. This um, Act repeals the Court of Civil Procedure Article 1701 and the Revised Statute 2313-16 relative to the default judgments to eliminate preliminary defaults and confirmation of preliminary defaults, to provide for the rendition of default judgments. And they're no longer calling it uh, final um, default judgments, the default final judgments. To provide for notice of the intent to obtain a default judgment and related delays, to provide for default judgments in parish, city, justice of the peace, and workers' compensation courts. It also provides, with respect to the delay for answering, 
um, we now have 21 days. And to update the terminology that's done under Act 174. And it also provides for an effective date and provide for related matters. Um, so in, when you're looking at the divorces, the plaintiff shall submit to the court an affidavit. So after you've gone through the time periods and you want your final, and I'm using the word final, but if you want your default judgment, you have to submit to the court your affidavit is specifically attesting to and testifying as to the truth of all the factual allegations contained in the petition. We currently do that, okay? That's nothing new. The original and not less than one copy of the proposed judgment has to be submitted. Then the certification indicating the type of service that was made on the defendant, the date of service, and the certification by the clerk that the record was examined by the clerk, including the date of the examination and a statement that no answer or other pleading has been filed. And we currently do that. That's under our form one or form G, our little checklist where we check off and put in the date of service and everything, but it eliminates the part where you have to put in where a preliminary default was signed because we no longer have that. And if the demand is for divorce under Civil Code Article 103.5, that's when there's been a contradictory hearing and a protective order has been issued based on the stipulation uh, after the evidence has been presented. Then it says um, a certified copy of the protective order or injunction rendered after the contradictory hearing or the consent decree shall also be submitted to the court. So anytime you're filing your petition for a divorce under Article 103.5 based on physical abuse, um, where domestic violence of the spouse, um, you have to provide a certified copy of your protective order along with your proposed judgment and the other documents. Yeah. No, okay, so consent decree is new, Professor Lee? Okay. All right, so at the con contradictory hearing or the consent decree, which if the parties stipulate to the protective order, then you um, have to, once the protective order is granted, attach that to your um, final judgment, well, your default judgment. Um, if no answer or other pleading has been filed by the defendant, the judge shall review the submitted affidavit proposed default judgment and certification and render and sign the proposed default judgment or direct that a hearing be held. And the minutes shall reflect rendition and signing of the default judgment, okay? So that's the process for um, getting rid of the preliminary default. And if the demand is for a divorce under 1031 and the defendant by sworn affidavit acknowledges receipt of a certified copy of the petition and they do the waiver, then this is pretty much the same as the former waiver we've always had. A default judgment of divorce may be entered against the defendant two days, as I indicated, exclusively the holidays after the affidavit is filed. So once that waiver is executed and filed two days later, then the party can file the default judgment and all of the accompanying documents. And the affidavit of the defendant may be prepared or notarized by any notary public. Okay. Under Act 259, um, our existing law, the Code of Criminal, I mean, Civil Procedure, Article 3947B, provides for the confirmation of the name of a married woman in the divorce proceeding. So a lot of times in our judgments, we will put that the uh, person wants to resume the use of a maiden name or whatever name they want to use. The new law changes the existing law by using gender neutral terminology. Okay, so instead of saying revert back to her maiden name, and I guess we will say they instead of her. They want to revert back to the maiden name of. Okay, all right. So child support, um, let me just look at act number 111, 
Uh, it requires that in any proceeding concerning paternity, a support obligation or arrearages owed, the Department of Children and Family Services shall be an indispensable party when providing support enforcement services on behalf of a child involved in the proceeding. So you have to notify the Department of Children and Family Services that you're um, having these ongoing proceedings or setting something for a hearing. Other than that, you may affect the um, services provided through support enforcement. <coughs> it may suspend it, it may um, cause a lot of problems. So make sure you know that the Department of Children and Family Services is an indispensable party and provide them with notice and include them on any proceedings um, that you may have when they're providing services to a child involved in those proceedings. Under Act 339, in addition to temporary suspension of a child support order due to an obligor's incarceration for more than 180, 180 days, this provides for the temporary suspension in cases in which the obligor is sentenced to 180 days or more with or without hard labor. It removes the present law exceptions to the suspension of child support order in cases where the obligor has the means to pay support while incarcerated or the obligor is incarcerated for an offense against the custodial party or the child subject to the support order or the incarceration resulted from the obligor's failure to comply with the court order to pay child support. So under present law, you couldn't waive that these things were in place. But now, I mean, you couldn't waive, you couldn't suspend it. But now um, you can, it removes that ex those exceptions and it requires the Department of Children and Family Services or either party to, the peti to petition the court prior to the first day of the second full month after the obligor's release from incarceration for a modification hearing to establish the terms of the previously suspended child support order. So you have to go in to have a modification hearing and you have to file and request that on the first day of the second full month after the ob uh, obligor has been released from incarceration. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, I agree. Okay, so um, it clarifies that the temporary suspension of a child support order due to an obligor's incarceration for more than 180 days includes all cases in which the obligor is sentenced with or without hard labor. It requires the Department of Children and Family Services to provide notice to the custodial party by regular mail instead of by certified mail that a child support obligation will be suspended and no longer allows the custodial party to object to the suspension. Hmm. Yeah, that's the regular mail and you can't object to the suspension. So when the obligor is released while the child is a minor, the, the department or either party shall petition the court prior to the first day of the second full month after the obligor is released for a modification hearing to establish the terms of the previously suspended child support order. Okay, and under 259, it permits the court to award attorney's fees and costs against the person who signed the petition, the party on whose behalf the petition was filed or both. And it also clarifies that the delay to appeal a judgment awarding custody, visitation, or support also applies to appeal a judgment modifying or denying custody, visitation, or support. And it also, um, Act number 259 also denies justice of the peace courts, jurisdiction over custody, visitation, spousal support, and child support. Okay, so that is the end of the civil uh, part. So right now I'm gonna look at protections from abuse for a couple of minutes and um, see what's new with that. Okay, so early termination of leases. Under Act Number One, it provides for a sexual assault victim to receive early termination of their residential lease 
if they assert in writing that they are a victim of sexual assault and request an early termination. It also provides, uh, they have to provide reasonable documentation of the sexual assault that occurred within the prior six months. Number three, they have to assert in writing that they will not permit the sexual offender access to visitation on or occupancy of their dwelling unit. And number four, they have to fulfill all requirements of the lessee under the lease agreement. The lessor must terminate the lease agreement on a mutually agreed upon date within 30 days of written request for early termination. So this provides the um, ability of a sexual assault victim to terminate a lease and not be um, held um, responsible for breaking a lease. Um, it's allowable under these circumstances. Okay, domestic abuse. Um, under Act Number 394, it provides that a petition requesting the issuance, issuance of an ex parte temporary restraining order pursuant to the Domestic Abuse Assistance Act or a complaint seeking protection from, a, from domestic abuse, dating violence, stalking, or sexual assault shall contain a written affirmation rather than an affidavit. Okay, so they can write a written affirmation now and have it signed and dated by the petitioner before a witness who shall sign and print his name instead of an affidavit in front of the, um, a notary and witnesses, they can do a written affirmation. And it provides that the affirmation is subject to perjury, punishable by a fine of not more than $10,000 or imprisonment at hard labor for not more than five years or both. Or both. In Act Number 411, it authorizes exemplary damages for an act or acts of sexual assault in the workplace to be awarded against the perpetrator of the sexual assault. It provides for court costs, reasonable attorney fees, and other related costs to the defendant, as well as other sanctions and relief for frivolous or fraudulent claims. And it provides for a liberative prescriptive period of three years to bring this action. Okay, and then the Act number 320, this act creates uh, the Louisiana Domestic Abuse Fatality Review Panel within the Department of Health. And that panel has to identify the scope and nature of domestic abuse fatality. So we're looking at the fatalities that occurs in this state. They have to gather information about whether the decedent was pregnant at the time of the death or whether there's medical evidence indicating that the decedent had been recently pregnant at the time of death. They have to list the marital status of the decedent, research trends observed surrounding the domestic abuse fatalities, review past events surrounding domestic abuse uh, fatalities, research operating rules for review of domestic ab abuse fatalities, and improve data collection, record keeping of the causes of domestic violence fatalities. The panel will also recommend system systemic improvements to promote, improve, and the integrated public and private systems serving victims of domestic abuse, components for prevention and education programs, and training to improve the identification and investigation of domestic violence fatalities. So that's a good panel to be uh, in place so that we can try to eradicate some of these um, homicides that are occurring in our community, a community with um, domestic violence and in the nation, in the world in general, domestic violence has a lot of homicides. Okay, so we're going to look at prescription for abuse and I'm almost through you all. Um, against a person for abuse. Under Act Number 322, it provides that actions against a person for sexual abuse of a minor or for physical abuse of a minor resulting in permanent impairment or permanent physical injury or scarring does not prescribe, okay? 
there is no prescription in that instance. It further provides that a civil action against a person convicted of a crime against a child does not prescribe and can be filed at any time following the conviction. It further provides that a party whose action under prior law was barred by liberty of prescription prior to the effective date of the act may file such an action against a party for a period of three years following the effective date of the act. And this was in effect since June 14th of this year. Okay, and so at, I'm at the end right now, and I just want to um, let you all know about a good resource um, that we can tap into, and it's called Isla, AylaLegal.com, and I, I want to pull it up, but we had a little uh, technical difficulties with this, but I'll just, um, let me see if I can pull it up and not mess us up, just bear with me. Um, one of our former students um, is brilliant in the fact that he has designed this software program. Okay. He was, okay, so he had his table set up yesterday. I thought he was going to come today. Okay, so, um, uh -huh. okay. Oh, he did? Okay, good. We got the proof? Good. Okay, good. Good. Um, so I highly recommend um, this program to anybody, and the courts approve of it. And so I'm just going to give you a brief little overview. Um, it says the mission of this program is to create tools that provide attorneys with free time and greater work-life balance. And you can watch this on YouTube. Um, the um, website is here. And I'm hoping I'm sharing this with everybody. Let me just, one second. Please share the link on the website. <laughs> I'm sorry, Libby. And successions. Okay, good. Okay, and I hope everybody can see this and I apologize. Um, the person who's uh, put this together is Austin Benton. And, um, and I'll just click on the family and see if we can get something right quick. And I don't know uh, if I need a new share, if this is gonna come up or not. Let me just check. And if we can listen to Austin for a second, just on family law, but he does, the programs that he create are awesome. He has criminal.
Okay. Okay, so I'm going to end that with this. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and he does successions, criminal law. So I, I highly recommend, well, stop here. I highly recommend his program, and um, I don't know the cost, but I'm sure it's going to be worth it, worth it to you. Um, to do this. And as he indicated, we have to update some things. So I know I have to update some of my forms with this preliminary default change, as well as the email addresses and everything else. So, and I know Austin sent a newsletter out to his subscribers with the update. So that's another advantage you get to that uh, program. So um, yeah, Sharon Florence says you just simply put input the names of your client and information, and then the form automatically just display. So can you imagine how easy that is? And then they also have access to it at the courts. You, the computers are available for you to do the form. So once you subscribe to this, you'll find that it's worth it, especially if you're doing child support and the calculations and everything. So Is another child support one out of Lafayette? The court uses one. So Professor Reed is in here helping me out, and she should I, she should have been up here telling me what to talk about, what not to talk about. But <laughs> so she uses that one. So I know we have like two minutes left. I want to again apologize for the late start. We had a little technical difficulty here, but I hope the information that I've shared with you today has been beneficial. Um, and it, it, that you wrote down the acts and go and read them in detail if there is something that you uh, are interested in. And I noticed we have, oh, the audio went up. Uh -uh. Yeah, so I hope everyone uh, Okay, oh, uh, Professor Tillman wanted to know if I can uh, repeat in-person audience questions. So Professor Reed was commenting and giving me some more insight and I think I've added to what she said. Okay, oh, for the one in Lafayette. So she's indicated that there is a program out of Lafayette for um, child support to um, help you do the child support um, pleadings and forms and schedules. And she says it's about $150 for the year annually. So you can't beat that. So if you, um, if you need any um, information on that, please uh, send Professor Reed <laughs> an email and I'm sure she will forward it to you. But again, I thank you and my time is up. The next uh, presenter will be presenting and uh, wait, two new messages. I don't wanna, yeah, say thank you. Okay, all right, thank you. Oh, wait, now I'm just gonna leave.